Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Empowering Your Tomorrow, Building Your Financial Future. Uh, my name is Kevin Maynard and I work with the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education and I'll be your, your host and presenter for this afternoon's workshop. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to be part of, uh, of a partnership that we have between uh, our organization, the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education and IG Wealth Management. I'm also delighted to be uh, working with the Toronto Catholic District School Board in making this workshop available uh, for students and teachers uh, throughout your school board. So again, welcome to this afternoon's workshop. This workshop uh, will be uh, engaging and provide an opportunity for you to get some information that's uh, re related to your future um, as a young person uh, completing a high school education and thinking about the decisions that you'll have to make uh, about money and about your careers. It's my goal to try and uh, identify some great resources that you can use to help you along that journey and to empower you uh, to make the decisions that are most appropriate for whatever path you choose. It's also my goal to give you information that may assist you in managing your money uh, and making career decisions um, that are related to those of you that are taking a high skills uh, major as part of your, uh, your coursework at school. So I'll try to comment uh, with specific information with regards to those objectives as we go through the workshop this afternoon. So our agenda is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, again, my name is, is Kevin Maynard and I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to be here with you this morning or this afternoon. Also joining me um, are a number of other individuals which we will introduce uh, after we play a short video. So Greg, can you uh, play the video from our sponsor, IG Wealth Management? Sure, Kevin. All right, here we go. I was 15 years old when I became a senior barber. When you come to a new country, even the smallest things are scary. Anything is possible when you have confidence. I wish they taught stuff like this at school. Financial confidence is important because it means that my children have a future. Having my own company gives me the freedom to have my own vision. I'm Janet McLeod. I'm Edouard Albert Archie. My name is Keegan Starlight. My name is Roman Mirinov, and there's no limits to what I can do. Thanks, Greg. And again, I'm Kevin Maynard, and I'm with the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, later, we'll have a representative of IG Wealth Management join us for the Q&A session, and her name is Susie Graham. I'd like to turn uh, the podium over to Greg Masowicz, who works with me at the foundation. Greg, you have a few words about uh, housekeeping. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks to everybody for joining us here this afternoon. So as Kevin mentioned, I'll be uh, assisting him mostly in the background. And before we get started here, I just wanted to go through uh, a few quick things as far as how things will work for the workshop. Uh, so first of all, we want this workshop to be engaging and, and provide as much value to, uh, to everybody as possible. And uh, a big part of that is, is you guys asking questions and us answering those questions for you. So whether it's something um, that's 
Kevin's covered and talked about in the workshop, or it might just be a, a completely separate question that you have around uh, a financial or money matter yourself that you'd like to have answered. We absolutely encourage you to, to pass those along to us. And we are going to have uh, 30 minutes of Q and a time at the end of the workshop. So uh, again, we, we want to, we want to answer whatever questions we, we can and, and that you guys have about things. And the, the best way to, to ask those questions is to use the Q and a button uh, in the black bar along the bottom of your screen. So in the bottom of your zoom window, uh, if you move your cursor down a little black uh, menu bar pops up and there's a Q and a button um, that allow you to type a question in and it just uh, lets us track things a little bit better in the back end. Um, if you're having any issues with Zoom um, and it's not operating how you, you sort of think it should be, um, you can use the chat button in that same black menu bar to send myself a message. Uh, again, my name's Greg and I can work with you to uh, help resolve whatever issues you're having. Uh, further to that chat button, again, we want this session to be uh, engaging and interactive. And, and you know, so if, if Kevin's talking about something that really resonates with you or you have an experience that you'd like to share with, uh, with us and, and others in attendance here today, we, uh, we absolutely encourage you to use that chat button. And I can see some people are already chatting a little bit um down in there which is great so um by all means use that throughout the workshop today to, to communicate with us and each other kevin is going to be uh sharing his screen with you during uh during the the workshop today um so you should always see kevin's shared screen but you should, all, should also see kevin himself speaking so you should have two windows on your screen if for, um, for some reason you're only seeing one or the other you can go to the top of your screen where it says view options and select the side-by-side -side mode and that will ensure you're always seeing Kevin along with his shared screen. Um, Kevin is going to be going through a number of resources and, and links uh, in the workshop today and by all means you're welcome to uh, take notes uh, on, on the things that he's talking about but we don't want you to feel like you have to scramble to write everything down so we've actually collected all of the links and resources that Kevin's going to be covering and we've uh, put those in a Google document that you would have received about an hour ago in the reminder email and you'll also receive it again tomorrow in the follow-up email. So um, that, that Google document lists all of the, the various resources and, and, and links to those resources that Kevin's going to talk about and discuss. Uh, we'll be we're launching a number of polls during the workshop. So uh, when you see those pop up on your screen, we'd love it if you'd take a second, read through the responses and, and, and make, your, make the appropriate selection that pertains most to yourself. Uh, just lets us get a sense of who's who's on the workshop here today and also allows Kevin to tailor things a little bit more depending on what those responses are. And finally, uh, once we uh, finish things up uh, here today and you clo close out of your Zoom window, there will be a survey, monkey survey that launches uh, in a browser window for you. Uh, again, we'd, we'd really appreciate it if you could just take a few moments and fill that out. Uh, helps us really get a sense of you know what you enjoyed about today's workshop. If there's anything we can improve to make these workshops even better going forward. So um, I just mentioned uh, polls. Uh, so I think we're going to launch into our first poll right away here, actually, and get things started. So let me launch this. And this is just tell us a little bit about yourself with with three options. So if you can just take a moment, read through these. I see responses coming in already, which is awesome. Um, and let us know uh, which sort of category you fall into there. Tons of responses coming in, which is great. Thank you very much, everybody. We're just going to give a little bit more time just to make sure everybody has an opportunity. And then I'm going to end the poll and we'll uh, we'll share the results with you. Just give it a couple couple more seconds here. Uh, I'm seeing one uh, one comment. Someone can't see the poll, and it, sometimes that happens. Just make sure you click uh, in your actual Zoom window, and you don't have sort of Zoom in the background and, and something else uh, working on over top of it. So if you don't see the poll, just click in. Uh, make sure you click and have Zoom as your active window. Um, all right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everybody here. So thank you, Greg. So just a, um, a couple of key things here is it's very interesting to see that almost two thirds of you are graduating next year. So um, you're, you're likely in grade 11. Um, so I'll try and address a lot of my comments in today's workshop uh, for, for you. 
Um, about a third of you are graduating this year. And of course, uh, you're all in high school. So um, that's all very important information. I know as well that uh, some of you are concerned because uh, your classmates are not able to get in. So uh, Greg has stepped away and he will continue to work on that issue to make sure that all of you have an opportunity to uh, participate in today's workshop. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, to continue. Greg, if you could close the poll. Thank you. And I'll just uh, move right along. So just give me a moment. So the topics for today, um, we're going to cover a number of things that uh, um, you, you are likely concerned about or interested in, in terms of how you will empower yourself to make decisions in the future. So one of the key areas that we'll be talking about are setting goals in terms of uh, spending, um, earning money, and budgeting money appropriately for whatever your future is going to be, whether that means um, one more year of high school or perhaps um, uh, leaving home to enter a post-secondary institution, a college, a university, or a trade school. Um, and as well, well, we'll talk a little bit about some of those decisions that you'll make and how they might impact on your spending habits, your budgets, um, what you're required to, uh, to have in terms of um, a roof over your head. So moving out, what are the costs associated with moving out and perhaps renting your own place or, um, or, or moving into a, a, a college or university residence. We'll also talk about the associated um, costs of, of going to school, things like tuition, um, fees associated uh, with, uh, with lab costs, um, or even uh, in this time of pandemic and virtual learning, associated costs to uh, equip yourself with technology that will enable you to participate in, in, in virtual classes. So setting goals, um, earning income, spending and budgeting is one of the, the key topics. We'll talk about ways that you can grow your money and the difference between saving uh, which is for a short-term objective, and investing, which is for an objective that, that is longer term in terms of, uh, of, of goals and objectives. We'll talk a little bit more about life after school and what that means to you. And we'll also um, chat about use of, of debt or credit when we don't have enough income and a lot of expenses and not a lot of savings. What can we do how can we borrow money for those short-term requirements that we might have or um, over the longer term for major uh, activities like uh, tuition or saving for school, student loans, those kinds of things. Um, so that, that's on topic for, uh, for today. In, in terms of, of what, what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be basing a lot of our conversation on setting goals. So a goal is a, a dream or a desire of something that we want to uh, achieve uh, over life. Um, and at different times in our life, those goals are going to be very different. When we're really young, a goal is a very simple thing. It might be a, a goal to have um, maybe some candy or a, or a book or to, uh, to go to the movies. So um, the goals that we had when we were young are going to change over time and going to be very different. You know, as we as we turn 16, maybe our goal was to get our driver's license um, and then to be able to borrow mom and dad's car. Um, later on, it might have been to to buy your own car. Um, and then as as you age and go through high school, it might be a goal like uh, attending um, college or university in a program of your choice. So, again, the goals that we have uh, in our life um, are, are are dependent on the situations that we're faced with. Um, and it's not really that easy to learn about the decisions that we're gonna be making around money until we're actually faced with, with those life events. So again, life events are the real um, um, uh, stepping stones that we go through in life um, and that affect our goals and our ability to manage money effectively for the different situations that we're faced with. Kevin, I'm just going to interrupt you very quickly here. I know some people were uh, were saying they were having uh, a, a, a 
classmates and, and others they knew were having a tough time getting in the in the workshop. Um, I have changed something in the back end here. So I'm going to ask if those people, I've just changed it now. So I, I'm going to ask if you can uh, let those classmates ask them to try again. Uh, they should be able to get in now. Um, if, if they can't, please let me know in the in the chat, but I think that should be resolved now. So uh, please, if you know someone that was attempting to get in and was having an issue getting in, uh, please let the, please ask them to try again now and it should be fine. Thank you, Greg. And uh, again, if, if any conditions uh, come up or, around the technology, feel free to use the chat button to let Greg know. So I'm going to continue. So life, life events and goals are impacted as well by our experience over time. You might remember when you were very little, your mom might have said to you, do not touch the stove. Do not touch the stove. It's hot. And probably if you were like me, you touch the stove. And you learn from that experience that your mom was actually right. If you touch the stove, you're going to get burned. The same thing happens in terms of the decisions that we make in life, especially these, those decisions about money. So I want you to think back to, um, you know, the decisions that you've made when you've had money as you've been growing up and try and reflect on those decisions and what lessons you learned um, as you apply that wisdom going forward. Um, it's also important to note that um, your, your uh, goals and the way that you manage money are also going to be in, impacted by your own values and the culture and values of your family. So not only are goals affected by your own individual circumstances, but they're also affected by those around you. Um, they do have influence on the decisions and the goals that you're going to make over time. And, and it's really important to note uh, that your goals and objectives are going to change as you go through these life events that you're going to be faced with. Now, the best way to think about a goal is it's something that I want to do, something that I want to be, or something that I want to have. So if you could take just a moment and think about how you would express a goal. A goal is something I want to do, something that I want to be, or something that I want to have. So just take a moment and think about that. Now, as you're, as you're thinking about your goals of, or, and objectives, the important thing to note is you shouldn't just think of it as a, as a wish or a desire. You need to use that goal and do some work around that goal so that you can accomplish it. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So again, a goal is a, a desire for a future state, something you want to achieve. And, and I like to express it as something I want to do, something I want to be, or something I want to have. So Greg, if we could take a moment and put up the next poll around common goals. Oh, it disappeared, Greg. That was the, uh, that was the, that wasn't the goals poll. So here's okay. the goals poll. So this is an example of a, of a goal. So again, it's, a, it's multiple choice. So take a, a moment and uh, reflect back on your own values, what's important to you, and uh, select the option that best illustrates your goal. Lots and lots of responses coming in, which is great to see. Um, again, I'm seeing a, a couple people are mentioning they're just seeing a gray box. So um, if that's the case, just make sure you're clicking in the uh, in the Zoom window and it's your your active um, your active window and there's not anything uh, over top of it. I'm just going to give it a couple more moments here to make sure everybody has a chance to uh, to get their selection in. And then I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everybody again. All right. So great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for, for participating. So 50% of you, half of you, um, your, your goal was really clear. And that's to enroll in a program of your choice uh, at a post-secondary institution. It's really important to note that post-secondary institution could be a college, it could be a university, or it could be a trade school where you develop 
um, certification, for example, as an apprentice. Um, it may even be something like a hairdressing school or something like that. So again, uh, these goals or objectives in terms of learning and education are really important to many of you as you're approaching those last years of your high school education. Um, some of you are, are interested in um, getting a job and beginning a career. And it's really important to note the difference between a job and a career. A job is a, a series of, of uh, pay for work activities that are in a bundle of jobs, if you will, called a career. So you'll have a number of different jobs that will be affiliated with a field of work. The field of work is called a career. Jobs are particular tasks that have titles within that field of careers. And usually you develop experience by having a series of jobs that are related to a career set. Um, so getting a job and beginning that first step in your career is really important for about 20% of you. Um, similarly, um, some of you were interested in that, that, that way to get income. So how to get income and save money for a future objective that you have. And those objectives might include investing money and investing is a way that you save money for a long-term objective to get that money to grow over a long period of time. When you save money, it's usually for a short-term thing like buying a car. And again, some of you indicated, about 3% indicated it was important for you as a goal to buy a car. So again, these are the things that you're going to have to think about in terms of your wants and needs and the passion or the priority that you assign for these particular goals as you make decisions around income and spending and saving between now and the time that you graduate from high school. So thank you very much, Greg. Um, if you could close, close, good. Now, in terms of accomplishing a goal, the, the key thing here is to be really clear about what your goal is. So the 3% of you that talked about a car, for example, you should probably do a fair amount of research to find out if that car is a used car or a new car. What is the make? How many miles uh, do you want on the car if it was used? What is the amount of money that you're willing to pay to purchase that car? So you need to be very aware of that. So you, you, that, that money, sort of the cost of achieving that goal is really important. For those of you that talked about uh, post-secondary education, be very clear about the program or course that you wanna take, what institutions offer it, how long it will take, and the tuition that's required, as well as the other expenses. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So in terms of the cost, the first thing is the money cost. The second thing is the time. How long will it take you to complete that activity to reach your goal or objective? And, and is it something that you're really um, passionate about? Is it really going to drive you to make some decisions between wants and needs and perhaps reducing other expenses or eliminating it and using that money for something that you choose? So be really, really clear about the, um, the goals and objectives that you have um, and identifying the needs and wants that you, 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 um, you're going to assign that to that particular event. Uh, I'm just going to share with you um, one of the resources that I would highly, highly recommend you take a look at. Just a moment. In life, you can spend your money, save or invest it, or share some with others in need. In addition to needing to set some aside for things like taxes, which unfortunately aren't really a choice. Your money decisions will depend on what you decide you need versus what you want. Everyone is different though, and we will make different decisions about needs and wants. Being able to recognize what is a need and what is a want will help you stay out of financial trouble by allowing you to prioritize items that are needs that your money should go to first. 
So how do we determine what is a need versus what is a want? Do you actually need this or just want it? The simplest way to look at it is needs are the essential items we need to live and survive. Needs include things like housing and utilities, food, clothing, transportation, etc. Wants are things that aren't essential, where we could still live day to day without them. Wants could include things like video games or a vacation. Sometimes it's simple to determine what is a need and what is a want. Other times it becomes more complicated. We all need shoes, for instance, but how do we decide what is sufficient and what goes beyond what is needed and becomes a want? Do kids need the latest Jordan sneakers or is that a want? Also, as the world evolves, certain things that were once considered a luxury and a want have become more essential to everyday living and transitioned into being a need. The internet would have once been seen as a want, but today is a fundamental part of how we communicate work, receive education, shop, etc. Is it now a need? So think carefully, is this a need or a want? You will face thousands of money decisions in your life. What are the costs of moving out? What's in my budget and how much for things like food, clothing, phone, and entertainment? How much can I save and what should I do with my savings? Do I need a car? If so, should I buy or lease? I like to travel. Can I plan for that? Am I able to help out others? Being able to distinguish between the things you need and the things you want will help you prioritize what your money should be spent on first, as well as help you recognize how much money is being spent on things you don't actually need and may be better off being put in savings. So the next time you're deciding whether to spend your money on something, think about if it's something you truly need or is it something you just want. So goals are in fact impacted by, by needs and wants, and they're also impacted by um, values. So you need to think internally about what, what's really important to you, take a look at needs and wants, and make choices based on, on that passion that's, that's really important. In, in terms of, of budgeting, uh, budgeting is, is a roadmap, if you will, that will help you determine um, what choices you're going to make from a financial standpoint. And, and a budget looks at things like earning money, saving money, spending money, and sharing money. Generally, a budget helps an individual to look at the income that they have from part-time work, the expenses that they have over time, and it identifies the savings that, that, that are available um, to actually uh, uh, achieve a particular goal. A budget is really important uh, because it gives you a plan uh, for your money and how you're going to um, look at your needs and wants and the values that you have and relate all of those things to the goals that you have uh, in your life as you meet these different life events. A budget really provides an opportunity for you to lower the levels of stress that you have because you'll, you'll have a bit of a plan um, that is focused on what you've identified as important to you, particularly if you're honest and you're accurate in terms of your goals, the cost of those goals, the time, and the degree of priority that you assign to each goal. A budget's a really good idea as well as you learn how to save money, how to earn money and spend money, because it allows you to compare your success one month to another. One of the things I highly recommend to high school students is as they prepare to um, move out on their own, that those first couple of months um, that you're living on your own, that you use a calendar or an app from your financial institution, and you really closely monitor your income and your expenses so that over time, you learn some new skills about how good you are at budgeting um, based on the, the new experience or reality that you have of living on your own. 
you'll really be able to identify how spending habits will actually affect your budget over time. And you might find some really good ways to save some money. The real key thing about a budget is you'll be able to use the information by monitoring your budget so that you can plan for future events based on your current experience. So a budget's really good. Remember, it's a plan or a guide that will help you move forward. Now, in terms of the money that we have coming in and our expenses over time, one of the key objectives that many of you identified uh, around money was helping to grow your money. And, and there are two things to think about. The first is when you save money for short-term goals or objectives. Most people save their money uh, in a bank account. And you save your money in a bank account because it's extremely low risk. You're not going to lose the principal that you put in a bank account. And it's very accessible. So in addition to it being low risk and safe, it's accessible. You can go to the bank or you can do an, uh, uh, on, on the internet or an electronic funds transfer. You can withdraw money that you put into a bank account. And you can do it relatively easily. It, it's also a great way to do it um, because... In a bank account, whether you have a savings account or a checking account, it's, it's very easy to make payments, to withdraw money from that bank account, and you can do those things to meet day-to-day -day expenses. So generally, people will keep their money in a savings account, and, and they'll hope that money will grow um, over, the, over the short term. Generally, people put money in a savings account, they earn interest, and that interest is compounded, usually daily or monthly, um, so that it grows over time. The interest rates in a bank account may be zero if in that bank account, it's a checking account. A checking account is used just for payments. A savings account, the interest might be slightly higher. And in a high interest savings account, the interest rate will be slightly higher than a basic savings account. Um, but there are some conditions over minimum balances and the uh, amount of withdrawals that you can do over time from a high interest savings account. The other important thing to note that is the um, accounts that are provided by most financial institutions, they usually have a package of accounts that includes a savings account, a checking account, and usually a credit card um, uh, for students, particularly when you reach um, post-secondary uh, uh, school. Usually the, the banks, the credit unions will come to your, uh, your college or university during frosh week and they'll offer you a variety of different accounts that may help you um, as you go through the next stages in your life. There's also a really good um, a website available from the Government of Canada. Again, it's in a resource document that Greg will have circulated prior to today's workshop, and you'll get a reminder of those resources um, after today's workshop. So in those lists of resources, there's a great site. It's offered by the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, and it's an account comparison tool that you can actually go online and based on some answers to some questions that you might have, like um, the province, so Ontario, what kinds of things you're looking for in your accounts, whether you want checking or savings, what is the minimum number of branch transactions you do, et cetera. And the website will, um, will recommend to you a number of commercial accounts from banks and credit unions um, that might be useful for you to consider. So again, it's an excellent uh, tool for you that will help you make the choice about different bank accounts that might be helpful. Over the longer term, if you wanna grow your money, the best way to grow your money over the longer term is not just in a savings account, it's by investing your money um, in a vehicle that will allow that money to grow quicker and over a longer period of time. Now, you'll wanna invest money when you have a longer term goal. Most people, like myself, the, the longer term goal, goals might be um, education, so post-secondary education. Or it could be education of a child. If you have children um, uh, or plan to have children once you marry, you, you may want to set aside some funds in a registered education savings plan. Or for many of us, it could be to buy a house or eventually for our retirement. 
generally when you invest, those longer term goals will involve vehicles that are riskier. And there could be a potential for a great deal of return or um, in fact, in many instances, that return can be volatile, which means there's higher risk, a great opportunity to make returns, um, but you could lose as well. Some examples of, of vehicles for investing money include the stock market. So again, the stock market means you'd buy a portion of a company by purchasing a stock. If that company does well and the stock increases in value from the time you bought it, that means you make money. If in fact the company does poorly and you sell the stock at a lower price than you bought the stock for, you lose money. So the stock market can be very volatile and you can in fact lose all of your funds that you've invested. Mutual funds are very similar. Mutual funds is like a basket of individual stocks, perhaps some bonds, which are another form of investments and other types of financial instruments. But if you think of it in terms of stocks, it might be a basket of different stocks from different companies. And when you buy a mutual fund, you buy a portion of those stocks. So again, it distributes the risk amongst a variety of different companies that may go up and down in terms of their value. So it's a way to level out the risk, but still get an opportunity for an increased return uh, when you go to sell some of those investments. One of the other examples that I'll give in terms of a long-term investment might be real estate. So many people will buy a house and they might buy it at a low price and fix it up and live in it and then sell that house later because they put uh, that, that they fixed it up. They put some sweat equity and improvements into the house. And hopefully the value of that house will increase over time because of that work that they've done and because of the market. There might be a low supply of houses and a high demand. So the price will increase. So if that happens, you've made money on that long-term investment of real estate. You could also lose money on real estate though. For example, if you bought a, a small one bedroom condominium in a high rise in downtown Toronto since the pandemic, the demand for those types of units has gone down. So it's likely that the price that you purchased that unit will also decline because the supply is larger. More people are trying to sell those one bedroom small condominium apartments and the demand people that want to rent them has declined because people have moved to other um, communities outside of the GTA or they've gone back to live with their parents because perhaps they don't need to be actually located in a downtown office building for their work. They can actually live at home and do their work virtually. So again, investing is for an objective over the long term and there are a number of ways that you can invest money to grow your money over the long term, but there may be more risk. Now there's some really great um, uh, 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 videos that talk about risk and risk management. If you want to uh, uh, Google uh, Money Last, we have a great little uh, series of 10 videos. One of them is, if it sounds too good to be true, it's a, a little funny video done by the Just for Last comedy troupe. It's called Money Last. And it shows how sometimes things aren't quite like they seem. So you have to be very wary when you invest money to make sure that you get advice around investments from someone that you trust and that the investment advice comes from a credible source. So not just uh, you know, an internet site that says that you can double your investment. You need to do some research to make sure that in fact, um, that source is, is credible. credible. Greg, if you could launch the next poll that takes a look at investment, if you had $5,000 and you wanted it to grow, where would you invest your money? So again, this is a couple of options. So select the option um, that best aligns with where you would invest that $5,000. All right, we got lots of responses coming in again. Thank you, to, thank you very much to everybody taking part. I'm uh, just gonna give it a little bit more time here just to make sure everybody has an opportunity to read through all the different responses and make their selection. A 
I know some people are mentioning they're still having an issue with a gray box. Um, I'm sorry, that might be from, uh, I've mentioned that might be from Kevin's shared screen, but you should still see the actual poll box um, appearing over top of that. Apologies if you're not. Again, just make sure you're clicking in the uh, in the Zoom window and to make sure that's the active window on your screen. All right, I'm going to share the results with everybody here. So great, thank you, Greg. So again, um, almost half of you uh, would share, would save your money um, uh, in, in in invest your money in a savings account, and that that's that's very good because most of you, based on the situations that you're in you need to save money for a short-term goal of or, or objective. So for many of you, it might be um, expenses that relate to um, uh, uh, basic things that you need or want uh, while you're living at home. So you're not in a situation yet where you're needing to uh, save money and have it grow for objectives that are long-term in nature. Some of you have said that you, you'd like to uh, have uh, uh, your investments in an asset like uh, gold or property or a car. Again, I just caution you that for some of those assets, you have to be aware that those assets may depreciate. That means that the value of those assets may go down over time depending on supply and demand. So I gave you the example of if you invested in a small one bedroom condominium apartment in downtown Toronto. Uh, if you invested two years ago, the price of that condominium was probably quite high. Right now during the pandemic, the demand for um, those particular types of condos has gone down. So the price, um, the price that people are willing to pay uh, for the condo uh, market for small units has declined, it has depreciated. So it may not necessarily be a good or wise decision over the shorter term. Maybe in five years, um, there will be increased demand for a unit like that. The other example I'll give you is a car. Even though we want a car, and in most cases, we wanna have a new car, the newest model, as soon as you buy a new car and drive that brand new car off the lot after you purchased it, the value of that car declines significantly. That's called depreciation. Um, and it, and the, the, the curve rate is, is quite dramatic. It, it, it looks like a ski slope. That means that if I bought a car and I sp spent $20,000 on it and I drove the car off the lot, one week later, actually one moment later, that value of that car declines um, over, over 30% because no one is gonna wanna buy my used car even though it's one week old, they're not one is gonna, gonna wanna pay the same price that I paid for it. So again, you have to be very aware of the uh, rate of depreciation of an asset. The stock market, over, two, uh, over one third of you said that, yeah, you, you'd probably be willing to uh, invest in the stock market because your goals are long-term. And then depending on where your life situation is, um, you may be more willing to take risk, which might result in a higher rate of return. As you get older, like me, I'm 58, so I'm gonna to wanna to retire soon. So the amount of risk in terms of my, my uh, stocks that I've invested in, I want those stocks to be very safe and secure uh, rather than risky stocks. Now, there are a few of you that have talked about mutual funds. So you understand that's great because a mutual fund um, distributes the risk amongst a variety of different um, uh, investments in the stock market, bonds and equities. It also, when you buy a mutual fund, you're actually paying for the service of a mutual fund advisor who puts that basket of stocks together. So you're actually buying that, that knowledge um, and experience when you buy a mutual fund. A few of you said Bitcoin. Bitcoin, although it might sound good, it's one of those risky investments. And um, the common saying is, if it sounds too good to be true, it may in fact be too good to be true. So thank you, Greg, for, uh, for uh, launching that particular, uh, particular poll. I, I would like to um, move forward and uh, talk about career planning, because we've talked a little bit about growing our money for short-term and long-term objectives. One of the, the ways that we can actually look at that income stream is not just from investments and saving money, it's also by earning money through work. And so uh, thinking of career planning is, is really important. 
In terms of career planning, there are, are four general steps that I, I, I highly recommend. The first is discover yourself. So know what your skills, abilities, knowledge, and interest is. Know what you like to do and what you're really good at. So really take a look at your own individual personality. You know, what kinds of things do you like to do? Have you seen different jobs and different occupations and different careers that might interest you? Are there things that, that actually you want to find out more about? So look inward at your skills, ability, and knowledge and what interests you first. Discover who you are and then use that information as you go forward into the second step, which is explore your options. By exploring your options, that means do a bit of research. Take a look at the skills, the interests, and abilities that you find appealing in yourself and take a look at jobs, occupations, and careers that might provide an opportunity for you to experience how you use those skill sets, how you use that ability, how you use that knowledge. For example, if you really like numbers, then um, a technical job, which, which requires a high degree of numeracy, would be really useful for you. But if you like to use your hands, um, you might want to be able to do something that is physical as well. And I'll give you an example. If you are a bricklayer, someone who builds houses by, by doing masonry work, you're not only using your hands, but you have to use the knowledge in terms of mathematical ability to identify how many bricks, how much mortar you will need to build a wall. So again, that's one of the, the key things that I recommend you do is Take a look inward at what you like to do and what you're good at, and then start to explore options that might equate the skills, abilities, and interests that you have to the careers, jobs, and occupations that are available. The third step is to make some decisions. And some of you are at that stage right now where you're thinking about um, college and university programs where you will develop further knowledge and, and further um, skills that will enable you to be um, in demand when it comes to employers hiring for part particular jobs. The fourth step is, of course, taking action. And that, for many of you, will be actually applying and being successful and being accepted to those post-secondary um, institutions that offer education and training. So again, those are the four steps. And you need to be very careful and, and considerate as you go through the steps for each one of the four. Now, there is a really great uh, website that might help you in this journey. It's called Job Bank. It's a federal government website. I did print off uh, a couple of the pages. So this is one of the pages from, from Job Bank that allows you to explore those occupations or those opportunities. And it, it has two sections. One are popular job searches. So this is job searches that a lot of people are, are interested in. Now, that means that there's going to be a lot of supply of people who actually probably do these kinds of jobs or occupations in the future. On the right hand side are in demand jobs. That means employers are looking for people for these particular jobs. Now, the good thing about the jobbank.gc.ca website is it has this information so you can look at both supply and demand for jobs. And you can begin to do some exploration because there's no use in you going through all that work of a college diploma or a university degree or even work experience if there's actually no job available for you once you graduate. So that in-demand or labor market information is really important. Again, jobbank.ca is the best spot to do this. It actually also has a complete listing of help wanted ads related to occupations that are in demand across the country. So this is an excellent source of information that you can use to make decisions and to guide you as you set your goals around your careers and objectives after you leave high school. There's also some really great opportunities. Uh, this is an opportunity that I would highly uh, encourage you to do, and that is an opportunity related to do you want to be your own boss? So if you um, have difficulty in taking orders from others and you want to direct your own work, 
One of the ways you can do that is through self-employment or something called entrepreneurship. So I'm just gonna show you a very quick video around one individual who took a look at their skills, abilities, and needs and developed their own job. So just a moment and I'll play the uh, video for you. Actually, unfortunately, there's a bandwidth problem here at my home. So um, I just encourage you to go in the list of resources that uh, Greg has, has provided, um, both prior to today's workshop and after today's workshop. And you, you can play the uh, video on our entrepreneurship, The Spirit Adventure. Uh, his name is Kareem. And, and he talks about a challenge that he had in his life. He actually uh, broke his neck uh, and he was an outdoor enthusiast. So what he did after he broke his neck and became uh, physically challenged is he created a business where he um, provided an opportunity for um, outdoor tourism companies to market their um, adventures uh, to people with disabilities. So a really great way to take a challenge that he experienced through a life event and apply it to his future. He empowered his future uh, going, going forward. So in terms of, of making some decisions around uh, jobs and careers, it's really important that you understand that a job is a stepping stone in a complete career, which is a series of jobs that um, are equated to skills, abilities, and interest. You should be really confident in um, the skills, abilities, and interests that you have when you search out uh, careers that might be appropriate for you. Try and, and, and search for something that um, meets up with your skills, abilities, and interests, and something that you think you enjoy doing and that you're good at. You know that you can get uh, increase your skills, abilities, and interests through things like um, co-op, part-time jobs, education, and training. So all of those things will help you to develop what is necessary to be a person who will be in demand in the labor market. But it's really important to understand that you'll have to relate those things um, to the cost of training or education. So again, it's not just the ultimate goal of getting a good job that you like that pays well, it's also understanding that there may be a cost in terms of time and tuition as you go through those things. The key thing there is to think about what is the passion that is going to help you to choose a career? And I ask you, is your income level the most important thing? Or are there other goals or objectives that will help you to choose something appropriate for you? For example, do you like to work outside? Do you like to work with other people? Sometimes those factors will be more important the actual dollar value that you're going to get. Now, we also know that education will help in terms of the potential for income. So this is a chart that industry illustrates. Over on the left-hand side, you'll see Canada, and you'll see a little uh, blue triangle. That blue triangle is an individual who has a bachelor's degree. The little red box is someone who has an apprenticeship certificate. The little gold square is someone that has a college diploma or certificate. And the green dot is someone with a high school education. So you'll note that someone, and this is uh, males in 2015. So a male between the age of 25 to 64, who was um, on average, the male in Canada earned on average of $80,000 if they had a, um, a university uh, undergraduate degree. A high school graduate, earns on average, if you're male, uh, back in 2015, $55,000. And again, you can see the different distribution patterns for different provinces. That distribution pattern illustrates the supply and demand of people and the demand of uh, employers 
for people with those various levels of, of education as it relates to jobs. Now, un unfortunately, in 2015, this is the chart for women. So you'll note over on the far left hand side, again, the Canadian average in 2015, for women that had a university degree um, was about uh, $69,000. So significantly less income potential, according to StatsCan figures for 2015. And similarly, if you look at the red box, um, those women that had um, a university, oh, sorry, uh, an apprenticeship certificate, um, generally had lower income than those that just had a high school graduation diploma. And that's because at the time in 2015, the um, trades that women were in were generally trades that uh, had lower level of income per, uh, per um, generation. And an example could be hairdressing. So uh, a hairdresser does not get paid a significant amount of money, but it is a red seal or apprenticeship uh, a, a applicable trade. Because many women are in that field um, and they all earn low amounts of money, it drops the whole um, trade school average for women down. So I would encourage um, those of you that are young women um, out there in high school today, think about other occupations that aren't traditional, traditionally affiliated with your gender. So if you're, if you're a young woman, think about becoming an airplane uh, mechanic or a pilot. Think about those occupations that are non-traditional in terms of gender. You have as much skill sets, ability and interest as any male does. So you should be able to generate a related occupational opportunities. Now, it's important to note as well that for uh, for uh, education and training, generally the cost of education and training post-secondary college and university is on average of about $20,000 a year, depending on the, the course, uh, the length of time and the school that you apply to, you should plan for at least $20,000 a year. So again, think about your goals and objectives and the budgets that you're going to have moving forward. Again, there are some really good uh, websites that will help you. Uh, in the resource list that I've provided, um, and I'm going to show you two of them, they have information on colleges and universities that might assist you in terms of uh, programs that are available, uh, the tuition costs, et cetera, as well as information available on awards and bursaries, so opportunities to have income that might help you as you make some of those choices. This is a website, the first one, which is the Universities in Canada website. And it has a list of some of the items that you should be considering when you go to university, as well as member universities. You can access each member university available in Canada and find out more information about the programs and courses that they offer as, as well as their costs. Now, similarly, colleges and polytechnics have a similar website. So I went into the website provided by them, again, in the list that we, we've given you in your resource list. And it has direct links to every college and university across Canada, where you can find similar information by program and course and institution related to um, uh, places that you can go to develop your skills, ability and interest that will get you uh, a job that you may want that's in high demand. In terms of budgeting, it's really important to know that um, as you continue in your life, you're going to have to continue to manage your money that's coming in, your income and your expenses. Um, and, and hopefully you'll have some savings on a monthly basis um, that you can build over to time and apply to these long-term objectives that you have. If you don't have enough savings, you may have to rely on incurring debt. And incurring debt is generally when you borrow money through using a credit card uh, or getting a loan. So it's really important to identify how much income you're going to have each month. And you'll get your income from a part-time job or a full-time job. You may have some savings that's accumulated over time or from funds that your parents have set aside as they've been earn earning money. They may have a registered education savings plan that you'll have access to. Or as I just showed you, uh, most post-secondary institutions offer scholarships, bursaries, and loans um, that you may be eligible for. So again, contact the institution that you're going to be going to look at their scholarship or a financial aids office 
and they'll have a list of awards and uh, bursaries, scholarships that, uh, that may be uh, um, available to you depending on your eligibility. You should also know how much money you're currently spending and how much you may spend in the future. What is important, a want or a need? You're gonna be able to have to make decisions about those, those things um, as you do budgeting. You'll have to take a look at, as you enter post-secondary institutions, um, tuition, books, lab fees, equipment, um, entertainment. If you're living away from home, things like accommodation and utilities, all of these things are important. If you actually um, decide that you're going to move away from mom and dad, you may have to um, go into a college residence or rent an apartment with friends. So you may need to look at some of these things. Who's going to go on the lease? Are mom and dad going to sign the lease on your behalf because you don't have a credit rating? If you're moving in with friends, how are you going to divide up rent? Um, if there's three of you in a two bedroom apartment, and one of the bedrooms has a, an ensuite bath, are you gonna be able to divide up your rent uh, proportionately in a way that is fair? How are you gonna expense uh, food? Are you gonna each buy your own groceries or are you gonna have groceries that you all use? What about pets? Um, are pets allowed in terms of your lease? Are you gonna be able to hook up utilities like natural gas, electricity, uh, or internet services? And what about scheduling? Um, if your roommates have late night classes and you have early morning classes, are you gonna be able to live together? So again, some of these concerns around moving out aren't just financial, but they are concerns that you should be talking with um, as you plan for moving out. Now, there are some really great um, budgeting resources that you can use. The first resource um, that I would recommend would be your local financial institution, your bank, um, may have a budgeting app that you can use. There are two other great ones that are available uh, from the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. Again, they're in the list that we provided. The first one is a student budget worksheet that has some great detailed information on uh, expected expenses that you will have if you move away from home to attend college or university. So again, a really great budget worksheet that you can fill in and it will uh, provide you with a detailed spreadsheet analysis of your income and your expenses uh, around post-secondary institution. There is also a really good feature on this Financial Consumer Agency of Canada website that looks at other costs to include in your budget. It looks at sources of income, even selecting student credit cards that might be appropriate to you, as well as tax deductions, uh, and tax credits that might be available um, to help you in your post-secondary education. Because remember, a college program is two years, a university um, career might be three, four, or eight years, depending on whether you do postgraduate work as well. So again, my, my advice to you is to really do a lot of work around budgeting and use these particular resources that I've, I've mentioned. In terms of borrowing money, when you come up short with the amount of money that you earn and how much you spend and how much you're able to save, be really aware that if you have a cell phone, um, that's actually borrowing money unless you actually bought the cell phone outright. You're actually leasing it over time. You may have to look at borrowing money for furnishing, furniture to furnish your apartment or to buy or lease a car. Student loans, if you need to have additional funds to pay for tuition, et cetera. And always remember that a credit card is in fact using debt. So you are using credit, you're going into debt when you use a credit card. And again, when you use a credit card, be very aware of the fees, the upfront fees for using a credit card. The rewards that uh, may be part of a credit card usually involve an additional fee. So if you have air miles, for example, or cash back, there is a fee associated with that feature of your credit card. Be aware that retail cards from organizations like the BRIC um, have additional fees or higher percentages of interest that they charge on their accounts. Never use your credit card for a cash advance because if you use a credit card for a cash advance, you pay interest that is compounded monthly from the date of that withdrawal of that advance. There's a really good, again, a card selector um, uh, website available via the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada that takes a look at your province or territory, 
your use of credit cards, and it comes up with a series of recommendations on credit cards available from the commercial market that might be useful for you. So again, I highly recommend you, you use these uh, resources available from the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. And again, they're listed on the resource list that we provided to you. If in fact you need to have a student loan um, uh, to go to school, again, there, is, um, there are resources available to you from your financial institution and the uh, federal government. The federal government has again, a, an online uh, loan repayment estimator that takes a look at the length of time that you'll have a student loan, the various interest rates, et cetera, and will provide you with links to um, commercial lenders, so banks and credit unions um, that might be useful for you. Just know that when you pay back that loan, you will pay back the principal plus the interest that is compounded over time. So be aware that you will have to pay that student loan back uh, once you graduate and get employment. That's all I have for now. I know we went a little bit over. And again, my apologies for those of you that were um, not able to get in at the beginning uh, of, our, uh, of our webinar. We will make available a recording for the webinar so that you can share it with uh, your friends and classmates. Uh, right now, we're available to, uh, to take some questions. So Greg? Thanks, Gavin. I'm just gonna add myself back here and I'm also gonna add Susie as well and ask her to turn her uh, her video and, and mic on. There she is. Maybe Susie, do you want to just introduce yourself and um, say a few words quickly? Yeah, thank you, Greg. I'm happy to be here today. I hope everyone enjoyed the workshop. Uh, my name is Susie Graham. I'm a certified financial planner with IG Wealth Management. I help my clients to grow their wealth and protect their wealth through the financial planning that I do and the investment and insurance options that I have available. And personally, I live in Oakville with my two teenage boys. One has recently started college and the other has started high school this year. So he's in grade nine now. And uh, we're going to do our question and answer session now. So I'm going to pass it back to Greg. And uh, Greg, if you can let us know any questions that might have come in. Thanks, Susie. And, and as Kevin mentioned, um, apologies again for the little uh, technical hiccup at the beginning with the, uh, I know some people couldn't get in. Um, but at the very beginning, we just did an intro video and some housekeeping stuff. So you, you missed very, very little actual content. So uh, it's great that everybody, uh, we got that sorted out and everybody could join us. So um, the first question we have here, and we have a few around investing, but the first one's a, 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 a simple one, but probably one that a lot of people are wondering. And it's quite simply, how do you buy stocks? So you can buy a stock um, if you have a, a stock trading account uh, from, your, uh, from your bank. So for example, um, I have stock in, in Air Canada because I have an account that's associated with all of my bank accounts at the financial institution that I deal with. Now, every time I make a trade, so I make a purchase or I sell something, um, I have to pay a fee uh, for that account. So that's the way that I do it. Um, Susie, as a wealth management specialist, you probably have some other um, uh, ways that uh, people can buy stocks as well. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as you mentioned, Kevin, you know, buying individual stock and there are also mutual fund portfolios that they contain sort of a, like a basket of stock. And, um, you know, there are individual mutual funds, there are uh, portfolios of mutual funds, and again, they do contain stock, and depending on how aggressive or conservatively you're invested you are will be, will determine the amount of stock in there. So somebody sort of middle of the road, not super aggressive, not super conservative, might have 60% stock in there, somebody totally aggressive, might have a hundred percent stock, but that's that's very aggressive. So it all comes down to your your comfort level, your goals, whether it's a short term goal or a long term goal. But yeah, as Kevin mentioned, you can buy stock individually or sort of wrapped up in a nice little package inside a mutual fund. And you can you can buy stock. Um, you, you you can get um, an, an online um, uh, an, an online account that's not affiliated with your bank. So that's another way you can do it. Again, some of them may be fee or commission based. Um, I, I think 
some of them have uh, minimum thresholds for buys and sells. So some of them might have a dollar amount like 500. Um, and if that's the case, then again, that, that concept of saving money up on a monthly basis so that you can, at, after you have reached that minimum threshold, then you can make your buy is, is something to consider. Uh, Susie, is there an age requirement for, um, for buying stocks or, or mutual funds? Yes, it is age 18. So the person has to be 18 in order to purchase them. Great. So one of the things, if you're under the age of 18, that you may want to consider um, is, is to, um, to do some, I'll call it playing around. So do some, um, uh, most uh, uh, platforms will have um, a, a, a trial purpose, a trial way that you can go on and you can start to play, uh, uh, play it like a stock market game, if you will. Um, there are some um, uh, online games that allow you to, uh, to practice uh, stock, mo stock market investments. The other thing you can do is you can work with your parent or guardian uh, to, to place some uh, trades on your behalf if that's something you choose to do. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. And we, I'm just going to make a quick note that we have a lot of questions. Um, so we're, we'll try and get through these, uh, try and get through as many, many of them as quickly as possible. Um, but if we can try and keep our answers concise so we can make, get through as many as possible. So uh, the next one is, um, uh, what's the difference between mutual funds and index funds? Susie. Yeah, they, um, so mutual funds, again, like I explained earlier, there are, there are thousands and thousands of mutual funds and um, from conservative to aggressive and uh, different amounts of stock and the bond portfolio in there. Um, those are their own individual product, whereas an exchange fund, an index fund, it follows a particular market, like sort of one that's indexed to the Toronto Stock Exchange, for example would be sort of mimicking exactly what's happening on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Whereas your own fund might not be doing that. If the stock market goes up 1%, say you might not have gone up that 1% because you're not 100% stock like the Toronto Stock Exchange is. So I'm not sure, I know what I'm trying to say in my head. I'm not sure if it's coming out clearly, but just it's, it's linked and uh, what's happening in that exchange, you'll see that reflected in your portfolio, like the downturns and, and the upturns as well. So an, an index fund, as you said, Susie, an index fund like the TSE would be any stocks that are listed on the TSE and are part of that index. So it's a group that's set. Um, that, that's an index fund. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Uh, next question is, do you recommend using your bank to buy stocks or an online platform? This person has heard online platforms have lower fees. So I'm going to start. Um, so it's a question of uh, your, your knowledge and ability and, and how you feel about your knowledge and ability. I do not use a, an online platform. I use a, uh, a wealth management specialist to guide me, to help me make the decisions. That's me because I don't trust my level of knowledge. And at this stage in my life, I don't want to take that risk. So I think it's an individual sort of discussion, Susie. I, yeah, I agree 100%, Kevin. And it's all, yeah, about what level of advice are you looking for? Because sure, you might save, you know, a tiny little bit. And it's not that much different, to be honest. Um, you might save a little bit going with an online brokerage, but who do you call in the COVID market downturn or financial planning, you know, whether you're planning for school or retirement or whatever your goals are, you know, you're not receiving advice, you know, for the, like all mutual funds have a fee but are you getting any advice for the fees that you're paying? And as far as where to start, like um, your, your, obviously your bank or who do your parents deal with? Do they have a financial planner? You know, and make sure it's a certified financial planner and somebody, you know, very experienced and very knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Um, the next one, the next one's an interesting one and uh, I don't think one that we've had before. So it's what about investing ethically? I'll start. So there are uh, within within mutual funds, there are ethically based mutual funds, which would be a basket um, that's been put together with that particular mutual fund advisor that meets the criteria of ethical. So um, there are um, um, 
funds that, that are based on that kind of criteria. Susie? Yeah, absolutely. And you'll see the acronym SRI often, like socially responsible investing. And those are funds that um, like they're not investing in firearms, say, and um, thing is there is a wide range of what's considered ethical or socially responsible investing. Some people, for instance, would not want any mutual funds that have anything to do with marijuana, say, where others do because they see the health benefits of it as opposed to it being like a street drug kind of thing. So your version of what's ethical could be different than somebody else's as well. But there are funds, if you even just Google SRI, socially responsible investing, you know, that, that'd that be a good place to start. The other one that I'll mention is, uh, for those of you that might have a Muslim background and, pack, and, and practice Sharia, um, there are Sharia compliant mutual funds as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Um, for the next one here, thoughts on investing in dividend stocks when investing for the long term. Susie, start on that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a good option, and because um, you're receiving not only your growth in the investment, but also the dividend from Canadian dividend paying companies. And you especially see the um, the results in that in like a non-registered portfolio, so outside of your RRSP or your TFSA, because the dividend um, dividend paying stocks are much more tax preferred than the regular stocks. So it really depends on where you're investing, because the RRSP, the TFSA, but then also anything outside of those two is called non-registered, and that's really where you see the benefit in there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, the next one, um, we'll give this one to Kevin. What's your advice on buying or leasing a car as a secondary student or graduate? Well, uh, first of all, I would say to you that for many secondary school students, um, the, the, the advice I would give is um, to, to buy something that's within your means. Um, that's the first thing. Um, now, that may mean... Uh, or to, to buy, to buy or lease something that's within your means. My, my, my practice has always been to learn from the advice given by my father. My father always said, if you're going to own some, or if you're going to get something, own it rather than pay someone else to have it. Um, now, um, that's a tradition um, that uh, my family always had. My, my family comes from a small town in southwestern Ontario, where you bought things rather than rented them or leased them. In fact, some accountants would say, if you actually look at the rate of depreciation of a known vehicle, like a, uh, like a car, um, that you should never buy a car, you should always lease it. Um, my tradition fights that. And as a result, I have always owned my vehicles. So again, um, the decisions that we make, the choices that we make are based on knowledge, values, and tradition. So for me, the value and tradition outweighs uh, the knowledge or the common um, uh, common feeling that you should uh, you should lease a depreciating asset. Uh, Susie, do you anything you want to add? Um, yeah, absolutely. There's uh, lots of you know. I would start with you know again talk to family members or you know who have they used and um, you know bore, whether you're buying or leasing. There are you know pros and cons to both. Um, starting, you know, going to the car dealer, talking to your family and friends online, of course, there's lots of information as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, can we invest in stocks on the New York Stock Exchange in Canada? If so, how do we do this? Susie, you. <laughs> yeah, you could do that through, um, through an online, bro uh, a U.S., I, as I, I should say, an American brokerage account so it wouldn't be something you could walk into your local bank and do but you could do it through um through a u.s online brokerage account are there tax implications when you do that though susie because you're you're buying a foreign a foreign investment right absolutely yeah you'd want to be dealing get advice from an accountant and talk to an accountant because then you've got canadian and u.s u.s rules as well so you definitely want an accountant who's experienced in both canadian and U.S. Thank you. Next question is, is investing in currency a good idea? How about gold or silver? Susie, I'll let you start with this one. 
Uh, yeah, this all comes down to diversification, really. Like, it's hard to say whether one's some good to invest in or not good to invest in, but you don't want to have all your money in gold. You don't want to have all your money in silver. So if it's part of a well-diversified portfolio, again, you know, do your research, talk to a certified financial planner, and um, like I said, make sure you have full diversification and a conversation about your comfort, your you know, how comfortable you are with risk and your time horizon and everything and just not putting all your eggs in the basket, so to speak. I would also say to you that um, uh, in, in terms of, of risk and diversification, if you purchase in a mutual fund, um, it's likely that that mutual fund has some of those, uh, those uh, assets as part of uh, the fund itself. Um, so that, that, is, that is an important note. The other thing is, um, historically, it, you can monitor um, the, the value of, of those particular investments over time. So you can do some of that research yourself about the price uh, and price fluctuation of uh, the example being gold. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question here is, what are some ways you can raise your credit score besides paying your payments on time? Kevin, do you want to start with this one? Sure, I, I would say one of the one of the ways is to lower the amount of um, uh, opportunity to borrow. And the example I would say would be to try and apply for only no no more than one credit card and use it, but pay off the monthly balance, not not the minimum balance, but the monthly balance every month. So apply for only one credit card and use it and pay it off every month. Yeah, that's great advice, and also. Uh, how much, oh, how close you are to your limit impacts your credit score as well. Um, like if you're right at 100%, you know, that's going to lower your credit score. Being at 90% lowers it, 70% lowers it, you know, so you want to keep it under 70% or ideally, you know, paying it off every month and not carrying a balance. But if you are carrying a balance, the closer you are to your limit, the, um, the higher your score is going to be. And uh, as Kevin mentioned, you know, just one credit card, but your cell phone, like Kevin mentioned, might be reporting to your credit bureau as well. Because when you apply for loans, whether it's a car loan or credit card, they usually want to see two, two uh, trade lines. So the credit card will be a trade line and the cell phone would be a trade line. So having both of those paid on time and not maxed out, those would really, really help increase your credit score or improve your credit score, I should say. And I'm going to mention one thing uh, that's important. So for, for those of you that are thinking of, of moving out of mom and dad's house next year, remember that if you, if you lease a home, you lease an apartment um, or uh, take a room at, at, at a college residence, you will be signing a contract for renting that space. And even though um, the federal government through the pandemic may have said that they, they're not going to allow for evict evictions, if you do not resolve an, an, uh, um, a disputed uh, payment for uh, property that you have left, if you've um, terminated your lease but not done it properly, um, that termination, that lack of paying on your uh, apartment um, or your college residence will show up on your credit rating. So make sure um, that you're aware that when you're, when you're renting space, that is also credit. You're borrowing that space for a contracted amount of time and you must pay that off. Even though government may say that you, uh, a landlord cannot evict you, that still re will report on, on a credit report. Perfect. Thank you very much for both of you. Uh, the next question is, how do you suggest dealing with student loans, especially if, if you have finished with your post-secondary education? Susie, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, budgeting is extremely important. Um, well, it's going to depend. You're finished with your education. Have you found new employment? You know, how much is your, your outstanding amount? If you do have employment and you've got income coming in, budgeting, how much is affordable? How much is extra income each month? You've got your money coming in, your you know, necessary expenses going out, and how much can you afford? And also what the, your requirement required payment is, of course, but if you can pay more than your required payment, the, the quicker you can pay it back, the better. But budgeting just extremely important at that time. 
So uh, I, I'll, I'll follow up. So um, it, it's, it's knowing what that minimum payment is that you're going to be required to pay and when you are supposed to be paying it back. You need to know that um, and you need to be planning for that now because remember, that's sort of a goal or objective to pay off your student loan. To know that, you'll need to know the time and cost. So that's the first thing. The second thing is whenever you are in debt and you're having difficulty repaying that debt, don't just forget about it. Actually reach out to that lender and tell them that you're maybe experiencing some challenge. So for example, if you have a student loan, um, you've graduated, but you have not yet been able to secure a job. So you have really no income. Reach out to the lender, let them know the situation and they generally will work with you um, to uh, make it more manageable, both for you and for them uh, moving forward. That's an important lesson to learn that it doesn't just relate to student loan. It relates to whenever you borrow money, don't just to walk away from an obligation. If you uh, approach it, you deal with it uh, uh, respectfully um, and transparently with the lender. Generally, they will work with you to develop a plan that's satisfactory for you both. Thank you very much. The next one is, where is the best place to hold short-term savings? I can start with that one if you like. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, so you've already determined your goal, it's short-term savings. Um, typically a savings account, or if, you, if you're 18 and can open a tax-free savings account, you can have a cash portion in there. You can hold mutual funds in a tax-free savings account as well, but for a short-term goal, I wouldn't recommend it because with the fluctuations that happen in the mutual fund uh, in the markets, you've put money in as for a short-term goal and say you have $1,000 in there and suddenly it's 900. You know, you don't have time to recover from a market downturn. So you'd want to keep it safe either like most banks have a high interest savings account or like I said, if, you've, if you're eligible for a tax-free savings account, just the cash portion inside the, the TFSA would be the safest bet. The other opportunity would be something that's a little bit um, a little bit more rigid than a, a, a high interest savings account. It's called a GIC, a Guaranteed Investment Certificate. But with a Guaranteed Investment Certificate, there are some um, requirements in terms of the length of time. So most of those, the, the minimum length of time is 30 days. Um, the, on average, they're looking for something beyond three, six, nine, nine months, one year or five years. So a guaranteed investment certificate where the rate of interest is secured, but you don't have access to that fund. It's not liquid. You don't have access to that money you tied up um, as easily. And if you do take that money up before the certificate is due, then there are significant penalties you pay. Thank you very much, guys. The next one here is what's the best way to save when you have a part-time, when you have a part-time job and wanting to go out of province to study for university? For example, this person wants to go to Montreal or Ottawa to study, but they still want to save up a little bit of money while doing so. So I'm going to say the lesson my mom always taught me was every time you get any money, you set aside 10%. That's what she always said. And I, I've done that religiously since the time I was about 14 years old, and it really worked for me. Uh, again, you get used to, every time you get money, you set it aside, you set it aside, you set it aside. Doesn't matter how much it is, you set it aside and it works. So that's the first thing I would say. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And a similar story here, when my, my son, when he was 15 years old and he got his first part-time job after school at McDonald's, blow the whole thing in two weeks, nothing, you know, he was asking me for money the day before payday. And then the next pay, it's like, oh my goodness, just video games and whatnot. So I suggested he just start putting a hundred dollars aside into a savings account, you know, right on payday, automatically a hundred dollars. So you treat it like a bill. You don't even notice it after the first couple of times. And now three years later, he's got $8,000. They wouldn't have had otherwise. So just starting, starting early and figuring out what your budget is, what's an affordable amount. That you can put away and just do it automated so it's aut automatically every two weeks or automatically every month or whatever works works best for you but just set it and forget it and uh yeah you'll be surprised how quickly it will add up thank you very much 
Um, the next one is, this goes to sort of the, the, the career avenue. Um, this person has asked is, what, what are some good jobs um, to, to sort of pursue in the accounting field? I'll, I'll start. Um, so there are many sort of jobs within accounting. Um, I used to do a lot of work in labor market uh, forecasting in the supply chain industry. So that is, you know, uh, jobs that are equated to getting goods and services from the point of origin from a producer uh, into retailers. So there are a lot of um, people that are required in that industry dealing with um, formulas and accounting types of activities. So I would say anything within supply chain it is probably really good unless you're looking at being an accountant, being a bookkeeper, those kinds of, of opportunities. Because supply chain affects everything. There is a lot of opportunity for people with accounting or numeracy skills uh, in that particular sector. Mm, yeah, and on that as well, uh, even like some, I have some clients that are a general manager of a company, but they have an accounting background, which is very valuable. And uh, some who have an interest in accounting like Kevin mentioned opening your own practice as an accountant, there's a chartered accountant, there's a, you know, a chartered professional accountant, or you may choose to get into my industry as a financial planner because it's numbers related as well. So there are lots, lots of options as well, absolutely in this industry. Sorry, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm just trying to uh, reply to some of the questions in the comments or in the uh, Q&A here in the back end. Um, that's, we have a couple questions around TFSAs, around how a tax-free savings account works, um, you know, if it's a good idea in general. So Susie, can you maybe just touch on a little more on what a TFSA is? For sure. Um, yes, it's a tax-free savings account. Um, previously to like this was in, the inception was 2009 and prior to this time if you invested outside of an RRSP a registered retirement savings plan any growth was taxed for you so if you invested a thousand dollars and it grew to a thousand one hundred you received the tax bill for that hundred dollars but it's I don't want to can't get into too much but there's preferred taxation and mutual funds and only 50 percent of the capital gain is taxed but that's a whole that's a whole other webinar um, but with the inception of the TFSA that growth is completely tax-free like your money could double and it remains tax-free um, it started in 2009 and there is a maximum each year that you can put in but somebody opening one up today who was 18 as of that year, they could put in $69,500 now, and that grows tax-free, and it's never taxable. There are over-contribution penalties. If you put in too much, you get penalized, um, but if you're within the rules, it's not tax-free when you withdraw. It's not tax-free when you pass away, so I would highly recommend it, but you need to be age 18 and have filed a tax return previously to be eligible. So again, if you have further or further questions about a TFSA or any kind of savings instrument, you can contact your local um, financial institution, so your bank or credit union, ask them about TFSAs, RRSPs, RESPs, um, GICs, what are the eight rates of interest that they apply, all of those things. Again, you as a consumer have the power in your hand to empower your tomorrow. Now, Greg, I know that we've had a lot of questions um, and I know that um, we're, we're probably just a little bit over time right now. Um, so we can do two things. Um, for those questions that are unanswered, uh, we will attempt to get answers for those uh, questions and, and distribute them after the workshop. So it'll take us a few days to go through them and get any additional answers that we require. So um, I'm gonna commit that Greg, Susie and I will do that and that we'll distribute those um, uh, as required to those people that have uh, registered for today's workshop. Um, I'm able to stay on for another uh, uh, five or 10 minutes, um, maybe till quarter after, um, if, uh, if we wanna continue. And we realize that for those of you attending, um, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to stay on as we go through some more of the questions. Perfect, that'd be great. Susie, are you available to stay on for a few more minutes? Yep, yep, I'm good for another five, 10 minutes as well. Great, okay, so the next question here is, is house hacking a good idea? And I actually had to look up this term and um, I guess it's it's really just buying a, a multi-unit property 
living in one unit yourself and then renting out the others to help pay your mortgage and expenses and whatnot. Um, so this person is, has asked, if, is, is, is house hacking a good idea? So I'll start. So um, house hacking, the first thing that you need to be aware of is uh, what are the uh, municipal requirements in terms of multi-residential buildings? And is the building, um, uh, is a building um, in a zone that enables that to happen from the municipality? Because if it's not, and you rent out space, you're liable for fees and other challenges, penalties, fines. And as well, you may not be eligible for mortgages um, if you've done that and the building is not a multi-residential building. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is any income generated uh, from the property that you don't live in, so from the unit that you, li you, you live in, the uh, spaces that you rent out, um, that space um, will be eligible for capital gains taxation and the income that you get uh, from your renters is taxable income. So those are the, the three sort of pieces that I'll add. Uh, Susie? Uh, yeah, and you'll want to check with your bank as well, because a previous one of the big banks that I had worked at before, they would not do mortgages for fourplexes and up. So if you had four units, they would not do it. So you want to check with your bank as well and uh, find out, or maybe you know a mortgage broker might have more, more options for you. And personally, I was just thinking, do you want to be a landlord too? And, you know, having, you know, you live in the one and you've got three sets of tenants and somebody leaves and maybe it's empty for a month or two and reduction in your income. So you want to think of it from a personal nature as well. That's right. Remember what your goals or objectives are, know what your knowledge, ability and skill is and your passion and then make the choice that's appropriate for you. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, the next one is, what will the consequence be if we don't save money for our future? Will it, jeopard will it jeopardize our career pathway? I would say yes, um, right, right away. Yes, because um, nobody's going to do it for you. Um, and, and if someone helps you out, it's still up to you to make the choices that are best for you. So from both a, uh, a self-sufficiency point of view, so if, if you choose to do something and it's something that you want to do, then you're more likely to do it because it's your choice. So that's the way that I would start with that kind of a question. Susie, with uh, uh, two, two, uh, two boys that are in sort of this age category, what could you add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sooner you start saving, the better. And, you know, talk to your parents. Um, you know, they could set up an, our ESP, you know, registered education savings plan for you. There's grant money from the government. Um, up to $2,500 that your parents or grandparents would contribute, the government sends 20%, so an extra $500. So that adds up, you know, huge. So, you know, it'd be worth having a conversation with your parents. Perhaps you're like, I have a lot of clients who are either close to retirement or recently retired, who have grandchildren, and, you know, they have plans for their grandkids that they don't even know about, you know, so if you do find you're going to be short on funds, you know, talking about talking to your parents and finding out, are there going to be any other funds available for you that maybe you don't even know about? I would say to you, the other piece I would, uh, I would recommend is make sure that you um, contact the uh, post-secondary institution that you're interested in going to. Um, because all of them have financial awards offices and all of them have a pool of scholarship and bursary money that is available to uh, uh, prospective students and uh, current students of those institutions. I used to work for one of those uh, uh, financial awards offices at the University of Windsor. And in, and in fact, um, a large pool of that money goes unspent because students don't apply for it. So there's these pockets of money that might be available for you at your uh, institution of choice um, that you may be eligible for. For those of you that have parents that work for a company that might have a labor union, for example, maybe your mom or dad uh, or caregiver worked for General Motors. The, the labor unions also have uh, scholarship and bursary amounts of money uh, for their members, as do professional associations. So if perhaps your, 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 your father uh, was, uh, was an accountant or, or your, your mother was a, a policewoman, um, 
those uh, organizations often have funds that are available for family members uh, to, to pursue, scholar, uh, to, to pursue um, education, and they may have funds available that you can access. I um, actually was able to get money when I went to university from a, uh, the Legion Poppy Fund, and that money, I was able to use that to buy my books. They also have money available to buy tools if you're an apprentice. Um, so again, there are lots of funds out there that you may be able to access. There's a, a award site called um, studentawards.com, which is a great website that has some of these award programs available, as well as lists of uh, institutions and the individual awards that they manage. Thank you very much. Um, that's great information, guys. Um, the next, we're going to hop back over to uh, investing quickly here. And this person has asked, can I open a custodial account to invest? Maybe I'll have Susie start this one off. Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the meaning behind the question. I assume you mean opening it on behalf of, of someone else. Um, it, there, again, it's kind of complicated. Like say somebody under 18 who wants to invest and you're going to be doing it on their behalf. You've got the um, the tax complications in your name then. So it would depend on your room in the tax-free savings account and you or you would be taxed if it's not in a tax-free savings account, if it's in a non-registered investment. But there are other, you know, it really depends on a lot of things. Um, there are trusts that can be set up. There's something called a Henson Trust, you know, for someone with a, a disability. Um, but that's something you, you'd want to talk to a lawyer. So it really depends on the reason why. I guess I would need to know that first, like why they would want to be setting up that kind of account because there's so many different rules uh, around that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Susie. Um, the next one is, with your experience in scholarships, how would I apply for a scholarship? And would you recommend applying for several scholarships? Also, when should I start to apply for them? So my answer to that is you should uh, know the, uh, the choices that you're considering for uh, post-secondary education. So if you know that there are three institutions that you're interested in, I would contact the financial awards office at each of the three institutions and begin to sort through what is available. Um, so I would start now by doing the research and then I would apply for as many as are open to me, as many as I'm eligible for. I would do that and do it now. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of that money sits and is not awarded because no one applies for it. So um, again, uh, it, it's sort of the, the world is your, is your opportunity. Um, so take a look at what you already know, uh, apply at those uh, three institutions, if you will. That's the first place I would start to contact the student awards office for each and then sort through the information that they have. Again, all of those links are available in that resource document that I shared uh, with, uh, with Greg and that Greg sent out to all of the registrants for today. The other good site, again, is studentawards.com. Yeah, and I would mention one other thing too, um, a good place to start as well is um, your guidance counselor at high school. They, they, they're very helpful in grade 12. I remember from my son last year and pointing you in the right direction. And uh, so I would definitely recommend talking to your, your guidance counselor at high school. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is uh, sorry, we've got a couple new ones that have come in here. Um, uh, this person, uh, back to sort of career path, are there any areas of study or any particular jobs that uh, you'd recommend applying to right now? So maybe if, if both of you could maybe just touch on um, some, some trends and uh, workplace areas that are sort of thriving or, or, or on the, uh, are on the rise right now. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment on two. Um, again, um, uh, places to go or for, for work or, or, or jobs that are in demand um, for employees are related to supply. So how many people are available with the skill sets and abilities to perform the task? and then demand um, how many employers want those people. So the, the greater the, the demand, the higher the wage rate, so, or the greater the opportunity is to get a job. 
if the if the supply of people is really high but the demand is low right that's not a place that you want to go in terms of occupation or careers so the two that i would say right right now given the pandemic the two that i would say right now are are in high demand are be anything that's related to healthcare or personal service related to uh, seniors and older adults um, so one of the job title is personal support worker is one of the job titles. So if you're interested, you have, you know, a, a need to help people, you might be very good with, uh, with biology or science, your communi communication skills are, are high. To be a personal support worker or a nurse, you know, that's a, the, one of the next related in that career uh, field, but a personal support worker is in high demand right now and probably will be over time. Now there's a high de degree of risk for that per person working in long-term care facilities, et cetera, but there is a huge demand for that type of work. And I would say that within the next five years, that will continue to be a high demand area. Um, one of the other areas of demand would be people like Greg. So Greg works with our organization as a not-for-profit. Greg works to support all of our digital or online activities, including social media. So a person like Greg is in high demand. So someone who deals with social media uh, content development or website development um, uh, is, is in high demand. So again, that's a good area of work to go into. Susie? That's exactly where I was going to start. I was thinking now with so many working from home, like I'm in my home right now, as opposed to I used to be on the road seeing my clients in their homes all day. Um, so technology, computers, anything to do with the virtual, like everybody's on Zoom right now. Uh, like Greg's position, absolutely, that's in huge demand right now. And also, prior to the pandemic, we wouldn't have thought, hey, is this a job you can do from home or not do from home? Right. Like, you can't do physiotherapy from your home. You can't do someone's hair from your home. Well, some people do, but I mean, you know, with the lockdown and salons closed and some restaurants, like, well, Toronto in the lockdown and Peel. So a lot of people are thinking that too, what's one that could just, you know, keep on going, like my position, for instance, didn't miss a day, didn't miss a beat, able to work from home just immediately day one. So that's an important indicator as well, because like hopefully we've getting, you know, see light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic, but it likely won't be our last. So it's nice to have something that, you know, you're not impacted if there is a situation like this again. I'll give you another example because they all don't all have to be related to technical ability as well. So, for example, uh, someone that does um, house renovation or house repair, they're in high demand right now because people are needing to stay home and perhaps uh, build an office um, or repair things so that they can um, have space for um, their kids to do uh, homeschooling, those kinds of things. So huge demand for people to do home renovation, um, for people to do appliance repair. Um, HVAC repair, all of those things are, are in high demand. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, now, I just wanted, there's still a number of questions that are still open, and I don't think we're going to get a chance to, uh, to get to them all. But as Kevin mentioned, I, I encourage you, if we haven't, um, if we haven't been able to get to your, your question, uh, first, I, I apologize. But uh, the flip side of that, it's been great to get so many questions. Um, we, we've loved answering them for you and, and trying to help you help you out. Um, if you want to send your questions, if, if for some reason well, we, we were unable to get, to get to your question, you can email me your questions and I will, uh, I will pass them along to both Kevin and Susie. And, and like Kevin said, we'll, uh, we're, we're committed to get those questions answered for you. So um, you can email me. I'll put my email address down in the... Um, down in the chat here, um, and then send them along to me, and uh, I, uh, I I will pass them along to Kevin and Susie and get them answered for you. Um, but I just wanted to uh, to thank everybody for for all the questions. It's been great. Um, uh, just a quick reminder that when you exit out of this Zoom session um, in a few minutes here, that uh, a, a survey will pop up in your browser window. And again, we'd love it if you could take a few moments and, and fill that survey out and just let us know how we did, what you liked. And if there's anything you think we could do uh, better going forward. Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, good luck with, uh, with the remaining years that you have in high school and your plans going forward for post-secondary education or entry into the world of work. Bye now. Stay safe.
Thanks, everybody. Bye.